Morning, Christians. Welcome to God's house. Making promises of any size is a risky proposition for people like us. Because we often don't have the power, we don't know what is going to happen in the future, and so our promises get broken and they end up uh, lying left there behind on the ground. But our God is not like that. Our God is infinite in power. He is perfect in knowledge. He is always faithful in his love. He keeps all his promises, and we can be certain that he will do so no matter how incredible they may be. Today we're going to see how God made a promise to a hero and heroine of faith, Abraham and Sarah, a promise that was way beyond belief of a miracle son, Isaac, to be born to them in their old age. And we'll see how faith in that promise justified them, declared them innocent in God's sight, how it empowered them, and how God kept that promise in ways that were even beyond their imagining. We'll begin with our opening song, By Faith. May God bless our worship.
Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We confess our sins to the Lord. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power, and keep us in your tender care. Amen. Amen. We pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in your Son, we have the greatest and most precious promise that we are declared righteous by faith. Give us trust that overcomes all doubts through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. Last week we heard how Abraham, at age 75, was called to leave his homeland and go to the land of Canaan. He trusted in God's promises, greatest among them, that God would make him into a great nation, and that ultimately the Savior of the world would come from his family. Now, ten years later, Abraham and Sarah still had no children, Biologically speaking, their time had run out. But Abraham trusted the impossible, trusted in God's promise of a son, and God declared that as by such faith, sinners are made righteous in his sight. After this, that means uh, after Abraham had just got done uh, defeating the kings of the north who had taken his nephew Lot captive, he rescued him. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir. But a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Response to God's word, and we'll sing, Be Thou My Vision.
Our second lesson is from Paul's letter the Romans, chapter 4, selected verses. God's testimony about Abraham is proof positive that we are justified, declared innocent in God's sight by grace, not by our works. Be a person Jew or Gentile, all who believe are spiritual children of Abraham because we share in his same faith. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are on the law, but also to those who are on the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. And he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, by being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were not written for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the word of God. We'll confess our common Christian faith according to the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascend into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll join our sermon hymn, What God Ordains is Always Good.
Please stand. God's incredible promises of mercy and forgiveness, his presence and a future hope are yours. Through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God's word for meditation today is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. By faith, Sarah received the ability to conceive children, even though she herself was barren and was past the normal age, because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from one man, and he as good as dead, descendants were born as numerous as the stars in the sky, as countless as the sands along the seashore. This is the word of our God. You may be seated. My dear friends in Christ, as I was growing up, my dad frequently gave me this piece of advice. Don't write a check that your butt can't cash. Now, it may be a rather rough way to say it, but the substance of his advice was and is sound. He was telling me that I shouldn't be eager to make bold and, and big claims that I wasn't willing to personally stand behind. Nor should I make promises so big that I couldn't either see them through or even have the intention of seeing them through to the very end. It was no surprise that scripture likewise tells you and me that we should think before we speak, and that we should refrain from making casual promises. Because, let's face it, we sinners have a horrible track record of keeping them, don't we? Now, when we say one thing and we do another, we establish big expectations and, and grandiose plans, and then life happens. Time runs out, opportunities are wasted, hearts are broken, and trust is shattered. Well, perhaps when it comes to promises, a better rule of thumb would be not so much what is promised as who is the one who's making the promise. You know, is it someone that I know and trust? Is it someone who has been faithful in keeping their promises in the past? There's someone who even has the ability to do what they say. And today, as we consider God's promise to Abraham and Sarah in their old age, his unbelievable promise of a miracle baby, their son Isaac, we will see how God reveals to us that it's faith in his promises that justifies us, empowers us, and finally becomes reality. In order for us to have a greater appreciation of God's promise that he made to Abraham and Sarah, let's first review where their lives were up to this point. Last week we were reminded how God had called Abraham from his homeland in Haran to, to move to the land of Canaan, he was 75 years old at the time. Sarah was 10 years younger. And God propelled him along by giving him some promises. He promised that he would become a great and mighty nation and that the Savior of the whole world would come one day from his offspring. Now that was quite impressive because up to that point, old though they were, Abraham and Sarah had had no children. Yet by faith they packed up and they went to Canaan expecting God to make good on his word. But as they were there, life happened. The years rolled by. By the time we get three chapters later in scripture to Genesis 15 that we had for our first lesson this morning, ten more years had passed. Abraham is now 85. Sarah is 75. Now, you don't have to be a biology major to understand that from a natural reproduction standpoint, Abraham and Sarah's window of opportunity was not just quickly closing. 
it was already slammed shut. Or as the writer of the Hebrews puts it, Sarah herself was barren and past the normal age of childbearing. And as far as Abraham was concerned, his ability to father children says he was as good as dead. But that's how our God works, doesn't he? With his gracious power, he takes things that are dead and nothing and powerless and hopeless, and he breathes in new life. He creates meaning. He multiplies wonders untold. But logically speaking, one can understand why Abraham would have had some doubts and, and puzzlement about how God was keeping his promise and how his promise would unfold. He even said to God, uh, Lord, if things don't change here pretty soon, my whole estate is going to be given to my head servant, Eliezer of Damascus. That was the ancient custom back then. If a man died childless, the property had to go to someone. And so custom was it would go to the head servant in a man's household. But in response to Abraham's assertion, God doubles up on his promise. And he speaks even more emphatically. He says, no, this man is not going to be your heir, but rather a son coming from your own body will be your heir. Then he led Abraham outside. At a time when there were no city lights to obstruct the view. He says, go ahead, look up at the stars. Count them, if you think you can. So shall your offspring be. Now, how many stars do you think are in the heavens, in the universe? Well, obviously, this isn't to be taken as a uh, literal number that God was promising Abraham. Scientists estimate that the number is 200 billion trillion. It looks like this. A number so big that it even makes our national debt look small. But yet, given this impossible promise, Abraham, who was just one, he and Sarah believed. They believed God's promise. That he was faithful, that he could do the impossible, that God does not lie and cannot lie, and he has the power to do exactly what he said. And they had that faith based on nothing more than mere words. The flimsiest guarantee that someone can give. But in response to counting God faithful, God's grace did some counting, some considering of its own. It says, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now this short, simple sentence is among the most important in the entire Old Testament, yes, even the whole Bible. Because it clearly shows, without a doubt, that sinners are saved not by our works, but by grace alone. Now, in response to God's promise, Abraham did absolutely nothing but believe. Believe that God would find a way to work things out and do what he said he was going to do. And by that trust, God declared Abraham righteous, innocent in his sight. Now we should note that God never makes this declaration about Abraham in connection with any of his other, if you will, impressive acts of obedience. He doesn't say that when Abraham got up and moved to Canaan. He doesn't say that when Abraham, not long after this, would take on himself the, the covenant of circumcision. 
Not even as we'll see next week when Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son Isaac to show God how much he loved him. None of those things made Abraham righteous. Only faith. And so by Abraham's living example, God was showing us what Paul expounds upon in Romans chapter 4. That grace and works must be kept separate from each other when it comes to our justification. Because these two things are mutually exclusive. Either our salvation is entirely by grace and a free gift or it is dependent upon us. There is some string attached that we have to do, and thus it is totally by works. Paul put it this way. Says, now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. In other words, they are owed to him. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited or counted as righteousness. And Paul goes on to reveal that this righteousness isn't just something special that Abraham had. No, he says it is something that through faith in the Savior, we now all have access to. So the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. It's faith that makes a person innocent in God's sight because faith looks to Jesus Christ. The one who lived, suffered, died, and rose again to make our innocence reality. My friends, as we continue through this Heroes of Faith sermon series of summer, let's be careful that we don't accidentally get faith and works turned around. Now we've seen already and we're going to continue to see some impressive acts of obedience on the part of believers. But Abraham and Sarah show us that righteousness from God it does not come because of the great things that they did. Rather, they were saved first by faith. And that faith that was living and working in them, through that, God then did remarkable things for them and through them. So like Abraham and Sarah, let's give up on our good works to save us and only trust that we are already saved because of what Jesus Christ has done. And holding on to that promise and then all of the promises of God attached to Jesus, God unlocks and unleashes his power in our lives as the testimony of Sarah's life demonstrates. Now, the only way that faith can hold on to a promise is by believing. Faith says to God, you do this. You take care of it. And that's what Sarah did. It says, by faith she received the ability to conceive children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. God had given Abraham and Sarah a very specific promise. That it was not only through Abraham, but it would also be through Sarah that the promised offspring and blessing was going to come. But now some might say, well, Wait a second, you know, didn't, didn't Sarah laugh when she heard that promise be given? Remember when God and two angels took on human form and they went to visit Abraham? And God says, when I come back this time next year, uh, Sarah's going to be pregnant and have a son. Didn't she laugh inside her tent when she heard that? Yeah, she did. But that tells us something else about faith. Faith has highs and lows. 
Faith ebbs and flows. But the most important thing is not the strength or the size of our faith at any given moment. Rather, the critical thing is who faith relies on. Our faith relies on God, who does not change. And so by relying on the Lord, even in great weakness, God enabled Sarah to conceive, to have a child through whom all God's promises would eventually be fulfilled. Whenever we read accounts like these, we also need to make sure that we have our proper biblical interpretation lenses on. Because otherwise, we can fall into the trap of over-applying God's promises to ourselves. And we can look at what God promised Abraham and Sarah. And, and we can then accuse God of being something less than faithful if he doesn't deliver the same things for us. Well, let's remember, God personally gave a very specific promise to them. God has not promised you and me that we will be fathers and mothers of new baby children in our 70s, 80s, or 90s. Many of us are maybe probably thankful about that very thing. But God also has given many of us children and others, though he is called to, to bear the cross of not having children for part of or even all of their marriage. And that's something that Abraham and Sarah well understood. But even in the midst of bearing that cross, God remains good. God remains faithful. Now God takes and he grows our faith in the midst of our weaknesses, in the midst of our sorrows. God can turn our lack into opportunities to be able to serve him and serve others in unique and unforeseen ways. And so what promises do we have that, that we can hold on to that give us confidence as we walk through life day by day? Well, one promise is God promises he will always provide for us. Just as he provides for the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, God says that we will have food and clothes. Now that doesn't mean that unemployment's not going to ever happen to anyone or that people won't uh, have money troubles or lose property or, or homes. But God says that he will see us through. I think back to the six years that I went to school to study as a pastor and how, yes, I was working part-time, Christy was working, but we had, like everyone else, rent and tuition and car bills and doctor bills and a growing family. And yet God saw to it that we were taken care of. He did that in ordinary ways, by ways of, of job and sometimes government help. He did it by extraordinary ways, too, of totally unforeseen gifts from God's people, from family, from friends, and even people who didn't even know us. God is good and faithful. Another promise we have that we can always hold on to is Jesus says he is always going to be with us. That he is personally with us, even in times and places where no one else can be. You know, it's my pleasure as a pastor to be able to, to remind Christians of that when they go into that nerve-wracking job interview, when they're about to go under for anesthesia and surgery, and even as they face death itself. And with that promise in hand, I've seen the impossible happen. I've seen anxious hearts be instantly relieved and at peace. And confident that they can go into and go through this thing with God at their side. And know that no matter what happens, he is with them. He is with them to lead them through the valleys. And he will see to it that they and the ones they love 
are taken care of and that it's all part of his perfect, loving plan for their lives. Lastly, when it comes to trusting in God's promises, everything that he promises ultimately becomes reality. In his time, God always keeps his word. Now, Abraham and Sarah, they had to wait another 15 years after God said to Abraham, uh, your descendants are going to be like the sands of the seashore. They had to wait until Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was 90 years old. God was literally working with two reproductive, biologically dead people. But that didn't matter because nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Abraham and Sarah's example also shows us that not only is God faithful, but he always keeps his promises in a big way. Now, as you read through the scriptures, God never is guilty of kind of keeping his promise. No, he's never like a dad who takes in and promises his family, well, I'm going to take you out to dinner tonight. But then he gets busy and he forgets to make a reservation. And because he has to go back into work later that evening, he rushes and, and takes them through the drive through instead. Well, I guess he kind of kept his promise of taking them out to dinner, but it definitely did not meet anyone's expectations. Our God has no such limitations. Our God never sets the bar too high, nor does he come in beneath expectations. Paul says that he is the one who has the ability to do incomparably and immeasurably more than all we ask or can even imagine. And even if you take something like God's promise to Abraham and Sarah that they would have numberless descendants, as many in the stars in the sky, even then, God in truth did not over-exaggerate. Now, not only biologically are the Jews and all the Arabs descendants from Abraham, but Paul says that spiritually speaking, he is the father of us all. And how many believers have there been throughout the ages? The book of Revelation tells us that heaven is going to be populated with a vast number so big that it is beyond anyone's ability to count. Well, the Lord is faithful. He has kept his promises. He will keep his promises his promise to forgive our sins and give us eternal life. And in the meantime, to provide for us and protect us. And his only one outstanding promise yet is that promise of the glorious resurrected body in the new world to come. That's the only promise that God hasn't kept. And he puts that out there in front of us for our faith and our hearts to grab onto and to look forward to until finally God's promise becomes reality. And he will do what is bigger and better more than we can even dream. As the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived. What God has prepared for those who love him. And so, dear Christians, keep on believing. Keep on holding on to God's promises, and you will see them wonderfully, beautifully fulfilled. One day, you too will see the glory of God. Amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for our prayers.
In our prayers today, we remember Elena Dale, who uh, broke her arm this last week and is recovering. And we also pray for Corey Hansen as he continues therapy uh, for his leg prosthesis. We pray. Almighty God, increase our faith in your wise ways and in your gracious will. Preserve us from reliance on our own plans and natural powers that we would ever trust in you and thereby be counted righteous in your sight through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ. Merciful Lord, you have raised up children for Abraham from all nations through faith in your word and promises. Bless your church on earth by defending us against the assaults of Satan, the lies of the world, and the doubts of our own sinful flesh. By your Holy Spirit, grant us faith that lives in purity and righteousness and at last brings us to heaven where we will shine, countless as the stars, forever and ever. And Holy Father, you promise great and abundant blessings to Abraham and Sarah, which they believe by faith. Give Christian fathers and mothers hearts which prize their children and bring them up in your word for their good and for the good of generations yet unseen. And as you sustain their faith and love and joy throughout their years of being childless, so also strengthen our loved ones who bear that same cross. According to your will, empower them to have children of their own or to serve as adoptive or foster parents and Christian role models for others. And gracious Lord, you call us to cast all our anxieties upon you because you care for us. In the midst of their tribulations, Bless your people with healing of body and peace of mind. We commend your mighty hand, Elena Dale, as she recovers from her broken arm, and Corey Hansen as he continues his therapy, and all of our brothers and sisters who are sick and suffering. As they consider your care for the flying birds and the flowers of the field, remind them of your eternal care for them in Christ. And Lord Jesus Christ, send your Holy Spirit to us as we prepare to dine at your holy table today. Fill us with godly grief over our sins and complete depravity. And then gladden our spirits with your promise that in your true body and blood you give forgiveness to the lost and power to the weak. In your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, knowing that you will hear the prayers of your people and answer them in your mercy, providing all things needful and beneficial through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this and every drink it, remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
at the ushers direction those who are members of Ascension Lutheran Church and fellowship with us in the ELS are welcome to come forward to receive the Lord's true body and blood uh, please proceed to the back aisle come down the center uh, you may take the bread and the fruit and the vine back to your seat and we will all commune together as a congregation uh, please also note that the gluten-free wafers are now on their own uh, separate tray in the center of the table we now come forward all things are now ready
Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink the true blood of Christ, poured out on the cross for you, for the forgiveness of all your sins. May this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you in the one true saving faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace and joy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. We pray. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, and that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, that all who have received in his true body and blood and the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll join our closing hymn, I Am Trusting You, Lord Jesus. Good morning once again, brothers and sisters. Pray that you are strengthened by God's word and sacrament today. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment to fill out the connection card on our website or app. We continued our Bible study, God the Great Humanitarian. Today we saw how God showed his love for humanity by sending his son from heaven to take on our humanity. And how how much that shows us that God really cares about humanity, that everything that he does uh, is for us and to save us. What a wonderful God we have. Uh, we'll continue our Job Bible study on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Our audio summer ser devotion series on 2 Thessalonians. Uh, this week we'll see how God has, by his grace and mercy, called us to faith, and eternal glory in Christ, all his doing. Uh, today is our church picnic. We'll meet in Nelson Lakeside Park at 4 o'clock. 
Uh, there will be plenty of food and fun for all. There will be games. Uh, it'll be 100 degrees, and there's going to lake there. So uh, if you haven't already signed up, don't even worry about it. Just come as you are, and there will be plenty for everyone. You can see the main things are provided. If you could just bring your own uh, meat, that would be great. Uh, we're looking, always looking for people to enhance our worship. If you're a singer or a musician of any age, any skill level, you can talk to Miss Decker and she will find a way uh, that you can serve uh, that's comfortable for you. Our VBS is starting in two weeks. Uh, you'll probably notice that there are some extra decorations as you go on your way to have snacks today. Thanks to all those who helped do that advanced decorating in every regard, the cutting out and also um, the uh, hanging stuff yesterday. They were here almost all day yesterday. Also, uh, we, if you want a free hymnal, we have our own red hymnals uh, in boxes on your way out the north entrance here. Uh, there are plenty of them. Uh, take as many as you'd like. Uh, you can use them for reference sake. You can play piano or whatever else at home and it is your free gift to keep. God grant you all a wonderful day and a wonderful week as we live holding on to his promises.